All right. Thank you all so much for being here. The first thing I'd like to do is for those of you that are not yet familiar with us at the GSU Prevention Research Center, I want to provide a brief overview of our center. Um, the Prevention Research Centers more broadly are a network of CDC funded academic research facilities in the US that study how people and their communities can avoid or counter the risk for chronic illnesses. Our Prevention Research Center at Georgia State is headquartered on the Clarkson campus of Perimeter College, and we work with community organizations, state and local governments, residents, and other partners in Clarkston to develop, implement, and evaluate culturally and linguistically appropriate interventions to address the disparities and determinants of health for migrants and refugees, and to disseminate that work at the community state and national level. I'm pleased that today our webinar will be focused on addressing mental health related issues in super diverse communities like Clarkston, Georgia. Um, we have a nationally recognized panel of experts today. Um, we have Tiffany Taylor, who is a therapist at a wonderful organization in Clarkston called Positive Growth. Alyssa Gutman um, is the medical director at the Philadelphia Human Rights Clinic and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine at Penn. Fabio van der Mew, you'll have to make sure I got spelled your, pronounced your last name correctly, Fabio, um, is the chief executive officer for the DeKalb County Community Service Board. And I think in our initial flyer that went out, we had him as the chief operating officer and he is the chief executive officer. So just wanna be clear about that update of, of Fabio's title. Darlene Lynch is head of external relations for another wonderful organization in Clarkston, Georgia, the Center for Victims of Torture. And Jennifer McQuaid is a visiting lecturer at Williams College and an assistant professor, clinical professor at the Yale Center for Asylum Medicine. And we are so pleased to have all of you um, join us for what I think is a really important conversation today. So thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing now so we can all see one another a little bit easier. And what I'd like to do um, in terms of our plan for today is um, I'd like to start off with having each of you very briefly describe your work as it relates to mental health and super diverse communities. Um, so whether that be kind of your, your work as it's related to the organizations for whom you, that you represent or the um, populations for whom you serve. Um, and then I'd like to ask the panel a series of questions about identifying and treating mental health issues in communities like Clarkston, other super diverse communities where um, many of you are working on the front lines to address mental health in refugee immigrant migrant communities. So let's start there. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go around based on where you are on my screen. Um, so I want to hear kind of about your organization and or your work. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that um, and the mission, the client served or, or anything else you want to say about your work in maybe just a couple minutes. And I'll start with you, Alyssa. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, some old friends and some new ones. Nice to see. I You get my 1990s Madonna look so that the puppy doesn't get into the meeting with us. Um, so uh, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I actually, um, many of you are in my old haunt in Atlanta. So I did my MD PhD down at Emory and I still have my whole family's down there still. Um, the organization that I run here in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Human Rights Clinic, is actually a really specific niche of work with uh, immigrants and populations. So we do pro bono asylum evaluations for asylum seekers in the Philadelphia area. We partner with Physicians for Human Rights and we are um, one of a group of medical student run 
human rights clinics around the country. Uh, ours is a bit different because um, Philadelphia is a rich academic environment, as many of you know, and we have multiple medical schools here. So instead of being a one school institution, we have medical students from all five area medical schools that are in Philadelphia. And as of this year, we actually reached across the river and we grabbed the med students from Cooper as well. And so now six institutions working on an executive board as medical students to deliver um, these pro bono forensic evaluations for our area. Great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Welcome. Uh, next up, Jennifer. But, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jennifer McQuaid. I am a licensed clinical psychologist, and I work in and around New York City and New Haven. And currently, I'm teaching in Massachusetts a couple of days a week, so I travel. Um, but I have a specialty in treating trauma-impacted patients, particularly refugees and asylum seekers. And I met the Georgia State team when Dr. Gutman and I were presenting last June on um, identifying and documenting psychological effects of torture and persecution in refugees. So it's really nice to be here. Currently, I'm an assistant clinical prof at the Yale Center for Asylum Medicine. And the Yale Center is a pro bono academic asylum clinic, similar to what Alyssa just described, but it's, um, it's not as broad reaching. It's just focused right in the Yale community. And at YCAM, which is what we call it, I work on both give, um, doing forensic mental health evaluations and training others and building capacity in the network of legal, medical, psychological professionals that provide these evaluations. So we, it's everything from recruiting, getting people interested in doing it, conducting trainings among um, med students, residents, already licensed professionals, and trying to keep that network going. And then um, Related to my work at Yale, I have over 12 years of experience working at a domestic violence agency where I really became passionate about training, supervision, trauma-informed care, and case consultation, but not just to social workers and mental health professionals, to lawyers or economic empowerment professionals. So really broadening the lens of who we consider bringing into that um, network of trauma-informed providers. Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome. Fabio. Hi. Um, so as the CEO of the Cap Community Service Board, uh, the Cap Community Service Board is the largest public nonprofit organization in DeKalb County that provides behavioral health, substance use treatment, and developmental, developmental disability services. Uh, we're also the sixth largest CSB in the state of Georgia. And there are 22 CSBs uh, in the state. Uh, as a safety net provider, we primarily serve individuals with no insurance or individuals with state-sponsored insurance like Medicaid. Um, the services we provide include crisis stabilization, outpatient, co-responder program, community support, and residential services. And so far, just this year, we've served 6,219 individual clients providing 46,000 services just in our outpatient services alone. We've housed 191 homeless individuals with mental health uh, diagnosis and have had 1,500 admissions to our crisis center so far this year. So uh, th uh, that's where we fall in as kind of the safety net provider for DeKalb County. Wonderful, thank you so much, Fabio, welcome. Darlene. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Darlene Lynch. I'm the head of external relations for the Center for Victims of Torture in Georgia. And uh, CVT is the oldest, largest um, treatment program for refugees and others who've endured um, torture or war trauma uh, in the world. So we have, we have clinics in refugee camps and in cities all around the world and came to Georgia in 2016. Um, to serve the refugee and asylum seeking population here in Georgia. So our clients come from more than two dozen different countries and speak dozens of different languages. Uh, we have a small clinic um, in Clarkston uh, 
that has a wait list that is quite, quite long. Um, as I'm sure Tiffany's going to say the same, there's just not enough uh, a capacity. Um, but what's unique maybe about um, CBT is that we have um, four pillars of work. And one of them is providing clinical services. That's not what I do. Um, we also do training. Um, for other providers and, and non-providers, you first responders and so forth. Um, we do research and what I do is policy work. Um, and so we try to ensure that our clients can really integrate and thrive in their new communities, wherever those may be. Great, thank you so much, Darlene, welcome. Last but not least, Tiffany. Hello, everyone. Um, I work at, um, I'm an individual family therapist, first of all, but um, work at Positive Growth. It's a community-based mental health um, center, um, and we have been there since 1997. So we work with um, children, families, adults, um, and just a really vulnerable population. Um, so we have also have a group home for boys. Um, we have after school programs, but um, where I work is the Multicultural Center, and that was started in 2015. So we serve um, refugees that um, are in the Clarkson area or beyond. Um, we work with over 20 languages. Um, a, we have therapists. We have um, community support individuals that help, and those, um, those individuals help more with practical needs. Um, we have a psychiatrist, but we work really as a team. Um, and interpretation is a big part of it too. Um, so one thing that I really do love about the Multicultural Center is a lot of the, um, a lot of people on my team that we work together with are refugees themselves. And so they've been there. And, um, and anyway, we, uh, it's been neat to see the Multicultural Center start. Um, but as Darlene said, we're on a waiting list too. Um, and there's just a big need. Um, but the positive thing is that refugees are seeking mental health treatment, you know, where that was a barrier before. Great. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Welcome. So the first thing I'd like to start off with, which is the, the question that I like to, to begin with, um, with a lot of these webinars with people of your caliber and experience expertise, is to ask you what's keeping you up at night. Um, what are, from your perspectives, the biggest challenges and barriers to either identifying and or treating individuals with mental health related needs, specifically in super diverse communities um, and or communities where there are a lot of individuals who are refugee immigrant, migrant, um, populations. I'll just let you all jump in as you see fit, and then I'll call on you if needed. I can, I can jump in. Um, and I, th I think your panel is evidence of possibly a solution to what keeps me up at night. But what I think about a lot is how to connect all of the dots um, between different individuals that are all well-intentioned and probably very well-trained, but in different in different parts of communities with different skill sets, right? So we might all be trained as mental health providers, for example, but not yet have that particular like extra level that will enable us to reach a certain subset of a community. But if we all can work together, um, I think that would amplify everything. So I, I think about this all in terms of capacity building. Um, and on a bit on a if we take it back a few steps, I know your question was about mental health, but for me the this this process starts with the legal representation and connecting the legal piece to then the physical and mental health piece. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Thanks Jennifer. So it sounds like in from your perspective, kind of that lack of holistic approaches or kind of fragmented care is a real challenge. Yes, I think so. Yeah, others. I think for me as a, as a provider right now, it's it's really the, the lack of staffing. Um, you know, we're seeing an explosion of need within the community. 
and right now just not having enough of staff to meet that need i mean we're an organization of people serving people i mean that's uh, and we need we need those qualified staff um, and not only just licensed clinicians and psychiatrists but also certified peers um, you know one thing that we have kind of become to rely on you know, coming out of the pandemic is having peers that have that shared lived experience that could bridge the gap between the community and our clinicians who may not have that background, who may not have that ex understanding of that lived experience. So really just trying to be able to have that staff and, and that often limits our, our capacity to, to serve clients. And, and we've seen a, a huge increase in the need for mental health services uh, coming out of the pandemic. So Fabio, do you see, and obviously this, these are our overlapping issues, but do you think that the issue related to staffing is that there aren't sufficient number of trained individuals? So is it a, is it a, a lack of individuals who have been appropriate trained to deliver the services? Or is that there's not the funding to hire those people, um, but they're out there? Or is it both? Uh, it, it's a combination of both. Um, I think just having the the trained staff that want to do this work, uh, community work, um, you know, during the pandemic, we lost a lot of our clinical staff who decided that they were going to work from home and, and do more private practice than working in the community, um, but then not seeing enough new clinicians and psychiatrists coming into this field. Uh, and then I think for funding, there's always going to be a funding issue. Um, the advantage that we had, I think, with COVID is that the federal government was pushing out a lot of grant funding and ARP funding and COVID funding, and that helped. Um, but and we have been in some situations where we may actually have the funding, but we just can't find the staff. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very kind of, uh, there, there's multiple issues that I think causing it. Um, but at the same time, the demand has significantly increased. This, this isn't just a you know, year in, year in increase, we're seeing huge jumps in the number of clients needing services. Uh, and so it's a very difficult time to have that staff shortage at the same time having such a huge increase in the need. Yeah. Others? I think I see three, um, three main themes that perhaps are what keep me up at night, uh, amongst other things. Um, so I would say money. Um, education in this particular subfield and stigma. Um, and so to tie those together, I think it sounds like from Fabio's end, some of the stigma part, at least in your community in Georgia, is down. So there are people seeking services, and we heard that from Tiffany and Darlene as well already. So people are seeking services. So that's helpful because in the cultural psychiatry zone, there's been, you know, much of what we've spoken about for decades has been in um, stigma in the small immigrant communities of seeking services. And it sounds like at least I can cross one of those three off my list. Um, but it does sound like from what Fabio said that my middle one of education is really lacking there. So having people have this particular skill set, it's, um, you know, people gaining the cultural competency to feel comfortable flubbing your way through new things and not being ashamed or embarrassed that you might be asking things the wrong way, letting yourself um, approach a different because we, we heard from, um, I think, Darlene, more than 200 languages um, are spoken. And so you're talking about none of us are going to be an expert in 200 subcultures. Um, so you have to bring in that cultural humility. And I think that there's a lack of education structurally for people to learn that. So it's hard to find those resources to learn about that. And then I think it's also just hard to find the people um, to do that. And just money, 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 cash is king. These things are hard to fund. I had a conversation recently, um, you know, my pie in the sky dream of my life would be to build a refugee clinic here in Philadelphia. We do not have one. We do not have Darlene and Tiffany and what Fabio does here in our community. And um, the question is, who pays you? Where does that funding come? And so I had a conversation with a department chair recently in a brainstorming session, and it comes down to, well, who's going to pay you for that? Who's going to pay you to do that? So I want to follow up on something that 
you said, Fabio, and, and kick this back to all of you, you mentioned this increase in demand for mental health services and kind of alluded to, and Alyssa <clears throat> followed up with this, perhaps part of that increase in demand for mental health services is that there's been some successful work in many communities to decrease stigma so that people feel comfortable seeking out those mental health services. I hope and believe that's probably true. Um, it, what else is, is going on here in terms of this increase? Um, I Personally, I see mental health related needs and attention large, you know, in a more broad sense across the country, attention to mental health care is, has just seemed in my mind to really explode it. Um, what is that about, um, especially in super diverse communities? Is it, is it just an <clears throat> increase in people feeling, <clears throat> excuse me, comfortable seeking out care? Um, is that why we're seeing this increase? What is, what's going on with, with this significant increase in need for mental health services? I've seen a big shift. I don't know about everyone else, but <clears throat> since the pandemic, a huge shift, um, both at Positive Growth and I'm in private practice as well, um, where I know Americans are more open to seeking mental health. You know, we're on, there's so many of us that are on waiting lists. Um, I do think with the refugee, um, as far as positive, positive growth, there has been um, trust that's been built, that's taken a while. And so once trust is built, then um, they feel safe to come. And so I think um, years ago, it was, I mean, it's taken several years with some of the communities we work with where they feel safe and then they, um, they refer each other. And that's not with every community because every community is different. But um, I think the suicide rate is higher. Um, I think people are overwhelmed and stressed. And, um, and I think people are at the point where they're not able to handle things. You know, sometimes you can just keep, they can just keep going, but I think people are overwhelmed and they're more open to seeking support. Yeah, and I would just follow up on what Tiffany's saying. I think we may be overestimating the reduction in stigma. I agree that there has been more increase um, in attention to mental health, but I also think that the trauma is greater. I think the need for care is greater, uh, particularly among Afghans who fled you know, horrible situations very recently. They didn't spend a long time in a refugee camp. Um, so I, I still think there's stigma. Where I do think we could check off if we if we did the right thing is money. There's a ton of money. There's a ton of money in Georgia. Um, but what keeps me up at night is that Georgia lags so far behind other states that are similarly diverse in addressing what is a growing, rapidly growing population. You know, one in 10 Georgians is foreign born. It's over a million people. And it, that, that growth has been 90% growth in that population over the tw last 20 years compared to 25% growth rate among native born Americans. It's not going away. We're becoming increasingly diverse each passing day. And Georgia, unlike other states, uh, is not investing in developing the services we need to provide care to these individuals. Um, and so I, that's what keeps me up at night. Um, we need to play catch up and we need to do it now. And we need to take the big pot of money that Georgia currently has and that it is in, interested in investing in mental health and make sure some of that is going to the communities we serve. You know, I, I, I think what we're saying, I think everything that's mentioned so far, I mean, it, it, I think what is what's happening in the community. And, I, and if you think never in our lifetimes has there been such a universal traumatic event that has impacted every single person on the planet. Um, and so what used to be, well, trauma only happens in certain communities or certain people or certain places. I think everyone has experienced trauma through the pandemic, whether it was, you know, I think everyone can recall the day that they were at the grocery store with huge lines of stocking food up and, 
their kids had to come back to school, uh, had kind of home and couldn't go to, and they, I think everyone has that day or, and I say, so this idea of trauma now is no longer something that just happens out there to other people. Now it's come closer to home. And I think now mental health is much more talked about. Um, that's helped with the stigma. But I think as Darlene pointed out, I think there's still work to be done because now it's taking that understanding of mental health and now having it, now we need the specialized treatment. Now we need the focus care on, on parts of our community that have always been dealing with trauma, um, that this has always been a problem with them, um, as well as dealing with, with the trauma that the whole community is dealing with. Yeah. It's interesting too, just that question of, so you know, you're seeing this, it sounds like mismatch in your Georgia community from what Darlene was saying between resource and structure. And then this question of people seeking services. I would wonder, um, Mary Helen knows how I feel about the TikToks and the Twitters and the things. Um, but I do wonder if that has gone a long way globally towards reducing um, the stigma to seek mental health treatment or to discuss mental health problems. So maybe there's one good thing that social media has brought us, uh, which is at least having a conversation where it's a more common conversation. People talk about trauma, people talk about uh, the experience of depression and sadness. And so I do wonder if that could be part, because those are global platforms um, in people feeling more comfortable accepting some of the services that are actually available. I actually had a similar thought that um, it almost seems like a layering effect, like COVID kind of brought to the fore for many people ways in which they might have been struggling before. And then so an exacerbation of possible existing mental health struggles, and then a whole new subset of people that were experiencing this trauma. And that trauma, like Fabio said, was a shared experience, which kind of normalizes it and opens the door. And so, and I also have teenagers, so I have very mixed feelings about social media. But before you said that, Alyssa, I was thinking too, like, I think it's just generated this, um, I'll speak from uh, uh, from my kids. Like they, it's almost like an, a right to seek self care. A right they have a right to talk about it, and the teens today have a right to access it. And where are we, the adults, in providing that for them? Because that it's part of how they're growing up and what they want to see as part of their life. And and so, given all these pieces, it feels in this conversation like we might feel we're at a threshold, like there's an increased understanding, there's an increased shared talking, but we have to link that to going to services, being able to provide them, building those services. So getting people in the door. Um, and, and, and Dr. Margaret, I think, you know, what you said is that it's, I think, hits on that point where mental health in some ways now become normalized in the, in the larger community, but it hasn't really penetrated kind of our societal way of delivering healthcare. You know, there, there is still this artificial barrier between what we consider healthcare and what we consider mental health care. You know, there's this separation of the two. And I think until we start to see the kind of that normalization penetrating and um, one of my fellow CEOs likes to, tell, likes to give an example of, you know, if an individual goes into a hospital with a stroke, they're gonna get care they're going to be treated in, in the hospital setting, and then they're going to be discharged to a rehabilitation center where they'll get intensive supports. And insurance will pay for that without, without blinking, because you, know, you need to treat someone that has that diagnosis in that type of environment. Yet, when you have someone who may have their first psychotic break or have a detox that they need, it's their, their, their first detox, um, they'll get a inpatient stay for three to four days and an appointment out to an outpatient clinic. And so even though a psychotic, your first psychotic episode or your uh, uh, recovery from uh, a substance use, that fundamentally creates changes in your brain that needs intensive rehabilitation. And so I think it's getting down to that next level of saying, okay, the society normalizes it now, it really needs to come into how we actually deliver care. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I would say too, you know, I think maybe some of this is is very much true in 
the refugee community or immigrant community for folks who've been here a while for their kids. But new arrivals, you know, who are not speaking English are not engaging on those social media platforms and, and getting that information. Georgia does not translate um, a lot of its information. For instance, the 988 number was recently released only, the website's only in English originally, and then was translated to Spanish when about half of the people who speak a language at home speak Spanish. You know, the other half don't. They're speaking a non-English, non-Spanish language. Yeah. And um, if they call that 988 line, they're not going to get, um, you know, immediately uh, connected to someone who speaks their language. So I, I, I think outreach into the community, person to person, build, building that trust that Tiffany talked about has been the magic, um, for instance, around the COVID um, uh, vaccine. That, that worked because trusted community members were in the community day in, day out, speaking different languages, having people from the community, having leaders, faith leaders, and so forth, talking to people about the vaccine is good for you. It's not a bad thing. You know, we should do it. It was a concerted effort that resulted in a higher rate of vaccination in Clarkston than in any other place um, in DeKalb County. But it took an on the ground effort and we need to be doing more outreach. We can't depend on computer, on internet or anything like that for these, these folks. Um, and uh, so I, I would really emphasize that, um, you know, we still have people, we have a community outreach person, we still have people who believe that if you admit to a mental illness, that you have some sort of uh, curse or some sort of genetic disability that will affect others in your family. Uh, you know, it, it's still out there. And so um, I really believe in the power of individual outreach, community outreach. Yeah. And Darlene, I think, you know, one thing that you and several others who've spoken about this are touching on an issue that I want to pivot to a little bit about providing culturally and linguistically responsive mental health care and how important that is and how challenging and complex that is. Um, and, you know, obviously many providers um, have been trained in Western institutions. Um, many of us here today are not people of the global majority. Um, so how do those of us who are coming to the table with that kind of training experience, um, with that lens, provide culturally and linguistically responsive mental health care? What does that look like? Well, I, I know that Tiffany and Fabio and others can really answer this question, but I can tell you what CBT does. I think, um, you know, we do have so many different cultures and, and different languages, and, and we can't be experts in all of those, um, but we can be, um, we can learn. And, uh, and so, you know, what CBT does is we have a professional on staff interpreter um, in person or by Zoom lately for some of our clients that follow our clients all the way through the process. Um, and they're specially trained and they're not a family member and they're not a computer screen. Um, they're an individual. Uh, and uh, so that that is a key part of our service. Um, I will say that that is not reimbursable. To provide that level of interpretation is not something that Georgia reimburses at this point. Um, so that's a real commitment on our part. You know, we don't charge any of our clients anything. We will bill them if they have insurance. Uh, but many of them, you know, particularly asylum seekers, obviously don't have that insurance. So um, a key part is we always say there are three chairs in every session, and it's the um, client, the, the counselor, and the interpreter. And, um, you know, I think that is really important. And I'll just say one more plug that um, Georgia does provide some, the Department of Behavioral Health has some cultural competence training, but it is a uh, one-off and there's no assessment. Um, other states will um, measure whether people are mastering those skills and will offer training throughout the course, you know, year on year. And uh, we have not been doing that in, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Thanks, Darlene. Yeah, Tiffany. 
I agree, I agree with um, Darlene. We really work, the interpreter is key um, and it has to be someone who really understands. I loved your word of your word lens because that's what I always think of. Working with refugees, it's a completely different lens than working with other populations and even working with different people groups. You have to understand, you know, where are they coming from? What have they been through? And I think one start, I, one concern and one thing that keeps me up at night is I think a lot of people who are making decisions um, or who um, are providing funding, they've never even interacted with a refugee. So they're making decisions. And until you really are in their world, you have no idea. And I don't know if you all feel this way that if worked with refugees, it's hard. What they go through is, you know, they've already gone through so much trauma and then what they're expected to do once they come to America is impossible, really. I mean, not impossible, but you know, it's really, really challenging. And so it takes a lot of people um, involved, involved with their care. And I think that would be, you know, my pie in the sky would be, you know, people that are making decisions, are they involved at all in our population? Um, or do have they even met refugees and spent time with them? So. You know, uh, I would readily admit that our organization was, you know, initially kind of born out of that Western based medical model. You know, we were very much clinic focused, you know, expecting clients to come to us and, you know, engage in our system and, and that kind of Western approach. And, you know, one thing that happened because of the COVID pandemic is that that was no longer our way to be able to get clients or, or provide treatment. So we had to look at ways of going out into the community and finding ways, finding new pathways, whether it's through be telehealth or whether it be through mobile mental health vans, like how do we can get out in the community? And I think that helped the agency evolve to go, to go away from that medical model. And you know, what we're realizing is that there's, there is significant gaps in the education that we have for our staff and how we operate, and then also the rules and regulations that we have to operate in. Uh, there, you know, as Darlene put it, you know, there is no funding for translation services. Uh, yet there's an expectation to provide translation services. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things that we're trying to figure out is, you know, um, how do we educate our staff? And fortunately, we've been able to do that through some of the grants that we've received uh, with additional cultural trainings, uh, not just the ones that DBC gives us, but actually ones where there is certification that's part of it, uh, trauma-informed care trainings. Uh, but then also, you know, we want to work with the community to say, okay, how do we then integrate those lived experiences into what we're doing? And how do we do that with the, the way the funding is coming to us, uh, the way the rules are set up here in the state of Georgia, which is not really focused on serving refugee communities. Um, and, but, I, but I think it's good that we're, we're looking at that. We're now moving in that direction. Now we can just get the rest of the state to move in that direction as well. Yeah, Jennifer. I've been, throughout this conversation, I've been thinking a lot about what we call in global mental health idioms of distress, right? So we might have a certain Western medical psych understanding of what a symptom set might look like or a presentation. Um, but for someone from another culture, their experience of distress might look completely different. And because I, I, um, I can't speak to the Georgia policies, but I, I, I think about this more in terms of the cultural interaction one-on-one -on -one or going into a community and trying to spend time understanding, um, you know, do you have a name for this experience in your culture? What do you call that that headache in your country. Um, so really kind of informing the service delivery with different cultural, like different literacies, mental health literacy, I might call it, right? And how is it seen in the Afghan community versus the Somali community? And so then how do we as um, people there to help and support, how do we use what we learn in our interactions? Um, so I think to make things work, uh, the time spent investing in conversation, meetings with uh, people that use services and also community leaders would be really helpful. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we were, um, I know in our 
Clarkson Mental Health Work Group, we had some really interesting conversations and um, Darlene had shared some additional insights from some CBT staff around um, raising community awareness about the 988 um, crisis line. And, you know, we had talked about maybe we should do like a magnet with the number on it so that it's always something that people know what to do in crisis. And, and all kinds of issues came up about like, do we, what, it, what does it mean for different cultures to have suicide, the word suicide, the word crisis um, translated on a magnet, on the refrigerator? Like yes. there's it's such a complicated web yes. of um, issues around like, the fundamentals of just like translating the word, uh, yeah. but then what does what do those words mean for people coming from different cultures in different languages? Um, it's you know obviously not as simple as like you just take the word and have someone translate it and put it on a magnet. Yeah. Um, so it's it's been an interesting conversation and kind of related to what you were just speaking to, Jennifer. Yeah. yeah. Alyssa, did you want to jump in before I pivot to another question? Okay. I like to, I like to hear Alyssa actually has addressed this in a former talk I heard of hers. We do debate constantly whether we should use the word mental health and this is ongoing. We haven't landed anywhere. Like so I we were in a meeting yet this week um, with a colleague from the Middle East and he said, do not say that. You gotta <laughs> call it something else because everyone in my community will reject it. And we haven't landed on anything. It's so I I I know you, you know, Jennifer and Alyssa had some really great words they used in a presentation at the um, conference we attended. So I would love to hear some of the brainstorming words and Fabio to your point like mental and physical wellness are the same they are one and the same and I know that we have a long journey in this country before we perceive things that way but until we can start using some language that describes it that way um I, and we haven't figured out that puzzle piece sometimes it helps to go back to basics Mary Helen, for if I describe what I do when I've um, given uh, little presentations for my daughter's school, um, I'll say, you know, if you don't know what a psychiatrist is, I am a doctor who helps people's brains and hearts, right? So little kids know what you mean by heart. They don't think I'm a cardiologist. Um, so you get a sense of that perhaps that replacement of emotional well being, um, getting away from don't don't throw behavioral health at me. I don't know what that means. Um, but I think maybe focusing on um, emotional health or talk about it. I help people who feel sad to feel better about that, help people who have some confusion with their mind or their mind plays tricks on them. And so those kinds of um, bringing it down to its core, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you probably don't understand it well enough yourself. So... You know, it's a it's a really interesting thing. CBT calls its work healing, mm -hmm. um, and uh, because some you know it can involve spiritual, it can involve a whole range of things, right? So we call it healing. We focus on what people are feeling. Are they losing sleep? Are they you know they can't um, you know they they can't find peace in in their you know when they're during their day. We talk about things like that, like concrete things. But when I go to the legislature or policymakers, if I talk about a healing center, they think it's some wacky thing. So I, I do not use the word healing in, in the right. capital, but we do use the word healing in Clarkston. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, Darlene. It sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost like the it's more effective to name the specific kind of concrete exper experiences like I'm not sleeping um you know I I'm feeling pain in, you know I have back pain I have you know all of the kind of somatic manifestations that we often see with mental health related distress like you know I I'm trying to think of other examples but just getting really concrete in how you describe that instead of kind of using these other this other jargon that doesn't really mean a whole lot to many people or it it is um 
it exacerbates stigma because of those terms are so loaded for many. Yeah. Folks. You know, we even measure somatic pain reduction in somatic pain, CBT, you know, we have our, a test that measures that in addition to reduction in anxiety and depression, um, because yeah, it's a part of it. Right. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left or so. Um, and I want to ask you all about um, reaching people with mental health needs. Fabio, you mentioned um, your staff, and I know um, Tiffany and um, Darlene's organizations are doing this too about community outreach. You mentioned like we can't just rely on people to come to us. Um, anymore. So talk to all of us about how to identify and reach out to people with mental health needs. What does that look like? What's needed in order to do that more effectively um, from, from all of your perspectives? Well, I think early on someone talked about, you know, collaboration and coordination. And I think for me, for what we're seeing is, is that there really needs to be kind of this bold step to bring together all of the county organizations, the state organizations, you know, court systems, nonprofits, and to really, you know, find out where we can coordinate, where we can collaborate. Uh, I feel that all of us hold a puzzle piece and that if we could all come together, just imagine the picture we could make. Um, and I feel reassured because I, I see other parts here, even here in Georgia, where they're starting to do that. Uh, um, Chatham County actually has a mental health coalition where they've brought together all of the partners, you know, from the sheriff's office all the way to nonprofits, and they work together in terms of addressing the needs. Um, Forsyth County, uh, right near us, is building a $34 million whole health facility. That's going to include, you know, healthcare, uh, physical health, mental health, uh, community uh, support agencies, and so people can go there, and you, and it's, it's kind of you can get everything you need uh, in that facility. And so I, I think it's, I think those are the things that we need to have here, at least in DeKalb County, is is that big, bold step of let's let's bring up, let's make there be a place or make there be a coalition where we can come together and bring all of our puzzle pieces together. Yeah, good points. I have a, a long background in agency work. And um, so when I think about coalition building, I think about how to initially get people in, right? And I think about um, my legal colleagues who will take a van or, uh, like a minivan, let's say, to the farmer's market or to the after school setting or somewhere where they know a lot of undocumented families might be living and they might have outreach about what it means to seek asylum and what as who can apply for asylum. And that's how they might initially bring clients in to the program. Because I think um, here, like uh, Fabio was saying, we, there can be a hub and then the hub also has to have outreach like arms, like tentacles, like an octopus or something in order to bring people in. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I agree. Some of the counties are doing great work and Gwinnett County is another one that where counties are investing in this kind of, of work. Um, I'd like DeKalb to do more, but I, what I really like is the Department of Behavioral Health to have a division devoted to looking at this rapid growth in the population and how we're going to meet those needs. And just about the most states, I'm sure Pennsylvania and Connecticut and every other state equally diverse to Georgia has such a department that coordinates. And, and, and it that would make things a lot easier because, you know, we're very, it's hard at the lower level to make those networks and to, to bring everybody together. And um, it is something that, you know, the Department of Behavioral Health could do. Um, and other states do do. So um, I think it, I, I would like to see that. Yeah. I think one thing um, we've been focusing on um, a lot at Positive Growth is um, the social isolation. 
that our families have been dealing with and how, and just the loneliness and they're, they're so used to community. That's, a, that's such a hard thing when they move to the U S anyway, because they're um, grieving. I mean, they've gone through trauma. They are grieving um, all the losses and they can't just walk out their door and spend time with neighbors. And, and we're so individualized in America. Um, so one thing we've been trying to focus on is how to, um, how to help with the social isolation. And, you know, we've been doing some group, we're going back to groups, but they're not necessarily westernized therapy groups. Um, they might be focused on ESL or they might be focused on citizenship or just really just being together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a huge need is not just clinical, but people being involved with these families and these individuals, because uh, Mary Helen does a wonderful job with that. And it's, and it's really a lot of fun. I mean, you know, just to get to know them, but it's a lot. I mean, when you're really involved with their lives, but I think it, I think that that could make a difference if there are more people involved. And what I've seen is those families that come and, and they have support, you know, whether it's in their own community or, or in, um, if they have Amer people that are from America that are helping them, whether it's a church that adopts a family or somebody else, it really helps. They're not by themselves trying to navigate everything. Um, so um, that's just one piece that we're looking at. But I just think in terms of refugees, um, that need for community goes a long way, but it just takes a lot of people and a lot of time. Yeah. And I think what that underscores for me, Tiffany, is the idea of mental health being that, that that's almost mental prevention of mental health issues, um, not just identifying and treating problems, um, but preventing subsequent development of, of mental health related challenges. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to do now, we have just a few more minutes. Um, there are a few questions in the Q and A, um, probably more than what we can tackle. Um, so I think what I would do now is go ahead and wrap up so that we have time for some um, final words from our panelists. Um, so if, if we could just go around briefly and if you could share, um, and this may, you know, you may wanna restate something you've already said, which is fine. Um, you know, a pie in the sky, kind of idea. Um, I always like to finish with something that um, either you feel is a really positive development in mental health, mental health care um, that you've seen in your work, um, or um, kind of what you'd really love to see, either from scratch or being, you know, expanded in some way. Um, so let me start with you, Alyssa getting on the hot spot. Okay. So I would say I mean, this was a really heartwarming conversation. This was full of hope, I thought, despite all the challenges that we were discussing. Um, I think that from my direct work, the uh, silver lining that I always find in the reason I do this work and will always do this work is that you get to interact directly with stories of resilience. It is a really beautiful way of finding one's own purpose and really getting a better understanding of the way that global society works. I think just from this conversation in my head, I'm like, well, my brother really wants me to move back to Atlanta. So I will come down and we're going to actually, my idea right now is we're going to start an after school program for refugee communities. And that is going to be, we're going to have arts and crafts at it. And we're also going to cook together. And then all the different communities will be in that space. It's actually going to be the same space that Fabio is getting together. And so we're also going to deliver medical care there. It's going to be one building, different floors, love it. And then you're going to come for the dinner and you're going to stay for the mental health treatment and everyone's going to feel welcome and it will just be a beautiful community experience. Mm. Love that idea. Well, count me in. We got to find that grant, Ashley. Yeah, we do. <laughs> okay, Jennifer. Um, mine is somewhat similar to Alyssa's. Uh, I like to think, I think because I spent so long at a domestic violence agency working, I really think that 
the majority of the world will never go to one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy. And so I think that we want to think about prevention and alternative ways of delivering mental health care, right? So for example, um, in that same building, perhaps, or somewhere close by, parenting groups for new parents where they might be run by paraprofessionals or community members, but there's guest speakers who are connected to mental health. And so there's built into these prevention programs mental health programming where people have an experience with someone like one of us on this call or many other people I'm sure in your community and they're like okay I could talk to that person or that they seemed very accessible and so you make the initial link and so then when it's needed going to that step up in care isn't so daunting I often feel like that's one of the um silver linings of doing all the asylum evals I do is that even though they may never go to targeted trauma therapy. They've had a positive experience with a mental health professional and they've had the opportunity to ask questions and found that their questions were valued and heard, right? So I feel like the initial connection, finding ways to make those connections and increase curiosity about mental health and comfort and confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jennifer. Fabio. I love all these ideas. I mean, it's, I think, in line with, you know, what I would love to see is a community wellness center that, that brings everyone together, that creates that place that people can go to, but then also allows for those connections for other communities or other organizations that are out in the community. So if they need a psychiatrist, they have access to it. They can get that service. Um, or if they need, you know, peers and, and also flowing back and forth. So if the, that center needs people who, who are seen as peers or leaders in the community to be part of that, um, that program. So uh, I, would, I would love to see that. I think that that, that is a, a start, <laughs> you know, where you can have a place, you can have um, people know where to go and you have a resource that can be accessed by other organizations. Um, so, and, and I do believe there's money for this. I, I, I think if at any time in our history, there is, there is funding out there, there are still a lot of counties and cities sitting in our fundings that they don't know what to do with. And I, I think there's a good solution there, um, especially now that for us to devote some of that funding to, to at least give us that facility. Yeah. Thanks, Fabio. Darlene, and then Tiffany in our last minute. Um, yeah, I think all these are great ideas. I, I will emphasize that one thing we do have in Georgia is a lot of groups working on this. We have a coalition of refugee service agencies with more than two dozen organizations that work and provide different kinds of preventative care that might be called a hiking group or might be called a sewing group. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of the pieces in place. Um, I would like to see more people lifting up this issue with the state because the state can really drive it. And uh, there's plenty of opportunities to do that, in including voting for mental health is a new initiative. Let your legislators um, know that you care about this issue and follow the governor's behavioral health reform commission and um, let folks know uh, about this important part of, of Georgia's community. Yeah, thanks, Darlene. Yeah, Tiffany, anything to add? Oh, you're still on mute, Tiffany. There. I love everything that was said um, because it felt really safe. And that was my pie in the sky would be um, for places where our refugee families and those that are struggling or even not would feel safe and um, where they could heal. Um, so whether that is, you know, what every, everyone was mentioning, I would love. The other piece is crisis when they really are in crisis or let's say they really are suicidal or there's a mental a mental health break, a place where they could go because we don't have that. And that's where I, that is part of what keeps me up. So that my pie in the sky would have both mm -hmm. and to have a connection between those two mm -hmm. with unlimited funding. So if Ashley and Mary Helen had this grant that they could find, um, that would be my pie in the sky would be, you know, funding just abundant where we could do all of this. Absolutely. We're working on it. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you all so much for this really interesting conversation. Um, 
Dr. Mary Helen O'Connor, who's on your screen, um, who's the deputy director for our Prevention Research Center, and I both encourage you to go to our website. It's on your screen right now. Um, we'll have a recording of today's webinar. Please share it with your colleagues um, and friends who couldn't attend today. Please feel free to email Dr. O'Connor or me. My email address is on your screen as well. Let us know if you want to be added to our listserv for future uh, brown bag seminars. Um, for those questions that were raised in the q and I will um, jot those down, follow up with you um, about those either one-on-one -on -one or as a group, um, if it's of interest to the broader community of attendees today. Um, and just want to really extend my thank you to our panelists today. Um, we appreciate your time, your expertise, all of your insights today, I think our conversation was really an interesting one. And um, I feel kind of both that the, the all the challenges we discussed, but then also all of the solutions that were provided, suggested today were really inspiring to me. And um, we are so grateful for your time and your willingness to join us. And thank you all for attending today. We look forward to seeing you on future Brown Bag webinars. Um, stay in touch and thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah.